last night we uh, started at 8.30 on uh, lecture 31. This is, I think, on page 4, no, page 5 of your handout material, First Peter. There was a chart there with uh, word frequencies on it. Then there was some information in an outline form, which uh, is covered in a different way in your textbook. Um, who the author of 1 Peter is, why some scholars have said, well, you know, he didn't write it, and then other scholars say, well, yes, he did. And so let's say that he did write it. Actually, there, there are two, two letters uh, that when we read the Apostolic Fathers, for example, Clement of Rome, who wrote in AD 95, uh, Polycarp, of Smyrna, who was a, a pupil of the Apostle John. Uh, his recollections go back into the AD 90s. Uh, Papius of Hierapolis, again, recollections back into the AD 90s. Uh, the two letters in the New Testament that we have that are undoubtedly distributed widely and uh, known well would be 1 Peter and 1 John. You know, they, they are attested in the quotations of early church fathers, um, you know, uh, widely and deeply. So doubts about Peter writing First Peter are, I think, uh, we don't need to take them too seriously. And I got a bit there on where he wrote it, the place of writing, the time of writing. Um, and let's just say it was probably in the 80s, 60s, not long before uh, Peter was uh, put to death under Nero. Reason for writing? Uh, well, to exhort readers to stand firm in the face of adversity. And in that connection, uh, let's read 512 of 1 Peter. I think that's sort of a summary of lots of passages that talk about um, why he writes by Sylvan Sylvanus or Silas, a faithful brother as I regard him. And, and that could be either that Silas was his scribe or the car courier of the letter or both. But he says, you know, by means of Silas or Sylvanus, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So, so all that he says in the letter, you could say, is about God's grace. But in particular, uh, God's sufficiency in times of hardship. This, this is the gospel message. Remember, God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. God is sufficient to sustain his people. So that's why this letter is written. Again, that's why Martin Luther said it's such an important letter for Christians, because true Christians are going to endure hardships for being Christians. And so we need the encouragement that comes from a personal letter in our difficult circumstances. And I hope all of you have an appetite for the encouragement of 1 Peter, because it suggests that you're walking in the direction that God calls his people. He doesn't walk them in the direction of Disney World. You know, Disney World Christianity. He walks them in the direction of, of a Christianity that's going to, uh, you know, uh, we're going to have to rise to the occasion because there's going to be pushback from the world and from the flesh and from the devil. And there you see the emphases of the letter, Rome number five. Uh, the first emphasis is on Jesus Christ as God's suffering servant. And um, several of you are giving me these uh, uh, Joy of Easter invitations, and, and I, I appreciate that. I hope I can be here. And uh, there is uh, the exalted vision of Jesus. Christ risen, Christ ascended. Christ returning, and those are all important parts 
of our eternal hope. And we've already read that in verses 1 through 9. But as you read through 1 Peter, you know, there's an exalted vision of what lies ahead and our inheritance. But then there is how it was for Jesus in his life. He was God's suffering servant. And we are called as uh, his followers to walk in his steps. Probably the place that comes out the most graphically and you could say enigmatically is in chapter 4, although there are many verses along these lines. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, this is 4.1, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking or same outlook or same purpose or resolve for the one who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions but for the will of God now this is you know, a very challenging verse to know all, what all that does and doesn't mean but the basic idea seems to be that there are two kinds of Christians. There are Christians that haven't really made a break with living for self-interest. And there are those who have, and it has cost them, and it's committed them. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I don't think Peter teaches a doctrine of sinless perfectionism, but I think he does teach that God calls his people to identify with Christ in his sufferings. And when that process has begun, then it can be said, you're a follower of Christ. And just as Hebrews wrote to people who were wavering, and he's saying, come on, cross the line. Identify with the one who identified with you. Uh, Peter, you know, in these very difficult words, is saying, since Christ suffered in the flesh, you know, he doesn't say, you don't have to. <laughs> That's what people want the message to be. Uh, but he says, and it's very graphic language, uh, arm yourselves. It's like, uh, uh, you know, put on the armor, pick up the weapons, it's a military term, arm yourselves with the same purpose, the way of thinking, because that will mark a break with your former way of life. And then, you know, he goes on and talks in those terms, verse 3, the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. You know, it should be in your rear view mirror, a life of self-indulgence and a life of self-gratification. And he gives examples, sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. And uh, they're surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. So, um, Christ is presented as God's suffering servant for us to follow, for us to walk in his steps. And beginning on number 32, on page 6, I have a summary of 1 Peter, which you might call the theological teaching of 1 Peter. First paragraph, this epistle affirms the blessedness of suffering for Christ. Second paragraph, it's not human suffering that dominates the book, but divine presence, direction, and protection. You see the two most frequent words. Everything that First Peter says, while it invites God's people to identify with Christ, it does so in a God-centered way and a Christ-centered way. Then Peter speaks of a bunch of things relating to God and our response to him starting with God's foreknowledge and his living and abiding word. Next paragraph, God highlights Christ raised from the dead, 
In many ways, he relates our experience in the world and our experience of God to the work of Christ and the person of Christ. Top of page 7. Uh, readers of 1 Peter will learn from insightful exposition of the Old Testament. Also from what I call stirring recollection of Jesus' example of brave self-renunciation. And frank exhortation to buck up and quit whining when adversity comes calling. Don't consider it a strange thing when fiery trials come on you. But rejoice. You know, to the extent that you're called on, rejoice. That's what the disciples did in Acts when they were arrested. Faithful Christians everywhere face the same kinds of suffering. Despite this, they can be assured that in due time, God will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish them. So this assurance assumes the full translation of doctrinal truth into everyday conduct. And those are the references um, that I mentioned last night with that word in the chart that I translated way of life or way of living, anastrophe. There, there are all these truths about Christ and all these truths about God and, and, uh, and God the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter. And the assurance that these things are in our lives play themselves out in you know the things we do hour by hour resulting in individuals in a church called a holy priesthood and a holy nation and this holiness arises through faith so you see the conclusion there peace despite the harassment peace to all you who are in Christ Maybe during uh, the break, I'll, I'll tee up, because I, I, I can get it on the internet here. Has anybody ever used um, the, the devotional aid, the divine hours? Um, it, it's, it, in the, the printed version, it's a three-volume set. It's edited by the late Phyllis Tickle. And uh, she... I know she spent years and years putting this together, but, but she draws on the Christian tradition through the centuries going back into, really to, to biblical times. And you know, when you read the Old Testament, New Testament, you can see that there are set hours of prayer at the temple. You know, people get together and, and so it's called the divine hours. And, and this was replicated in the monastic era. And, and to this day, there are religious orders around the world, a lot of them Catholic. Orthodox, uh, some Protestant, and, and they pray at set times during the day. And there are, there are set prayers. There are morning, the morning prayer office, the midday office, the evening office, and then right before bedtime, the Vespers office. And so I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll show you that. And uh, it, it's something that lots of Christians have found very helpful. I, I myself, I always pray the morning office when I get up, along with... Uh, heating coffee, that's the first thing I do in the morning before I do anything else. And um, it's a way to make sure that our lives are intersecting God all of our waking moments. You know, a little leaven leavens a whole loaf, loaf. And I know many of you have quiet times, and that quiet time, it affects your whole day, and, and it should. And so this would be another way to have uh, a quiet time, and that's a major concern to First Peter. You know, not only that we exalt God, not only that we identify them as a suffering, but you know, there are lots of hours of the day that, I mean, we're not suffering, <laughs> uh, but we don't want to live oblivious to God. You know, just like in a good marriage, as you go through the day, you're connected with your spouse, even though you may be working 40 miles apart, you know, there's a connection there. Or if you have a good relationship with your kids, even though you're separated by school or whatever, there's a connection there. And First Peter, if, if, you, if you look at these way of life references, you know, he's very concerned that the people of God have God 
in their, that, that, that they're holding God in their consciousness, that they're aware of God so that they can, they can bless him. That is to say, we can uh, reflect back to him our, our consciousness of uh, our, our, our appreciation for him and our, and our love for him. So in that sense, while there are a lot of difficult passages in First Peter, it's a very practical book because of this emphasis on, uh, on daily living. And it doesn't matter where we live. Because people live in a lot of different places. You know, geographically, institutionally, if you're in the military, um, you work in a hospital. Uh, sometimes when you're working, and I don't know how many of you are retired, but, but sometimes when you're working, especially from Monday to Friday, it just seems like all you're doing is working and going home and sleeping so you can get up and go back to work. <laughs> you, you, you're just so engrossed in your work, and some jobs are that demanding. Uh, certainly, mothering is like that when you have little kids. You're just not off duty. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't turn your back for 15 seconds. And you're con when you go to bed at night, even in your sleep, if certain sounds, you're, you're awake. And Peter, 1 Peter is a book that's, that addresses people who live very deeply engaged in the world. Because, you know, we're placed in this world and we're given responsibilities in it. So it's not either God or the world, but it's God coming into our world in a way that he changes everything we do. In, in, in what it is that we, we have to set our hands to. So we can be at peace in the pursuit of God and in the reception of God's provision for us no matter where we live, um, no matter what we find ourselves doing. First Peter. Number 33 on your handouts. We're almost to a break. I can feel the pressure rising that you are wanting to uh, get some downtime here. But we have time to look at our famous frequency list. I've never seen these lists in books anywhere in my life, so this, this is something unique, and, and I hope you appreciate uh, how weird it is. <laughs> But the word that occurs the most frequently, and actually you can see the five, the top five words. Lord, day, and especially the day of the Lord. You know, that, that's, that's the connection. It's not like he's talking about uh, uh, day and night or something, but he's talking about day uh, you could say eschatologically you know, in terms of the last day he has a lot to say about life in relation to the return of the Lord the day of the Lord and as Peter writes and as you read 2nd Peter you know, you're, you're aware that he writes like somebody who's about to die. So it's kind of like 2 Timothy. He's conscious of the fact that he's probably not going to be around much longer. And so uh, he writes with this consciousness of the importance of the hour in the light of our standing before God on the last day. Uh, it talks about Jesus a lot, talks about Christ a lot. Normally, after the word Jesus, he talks about God a lot, especially in chapter 1. Then, he uses this term, beloved. And uh, it's a pregnant word in English. It sounds Victorian. Dearly beloved. <laughs> Uh, we don't use that word, probably in normal English, but it's a word that's closely related to that word we saw in 1 Peter, elect. If God addresses 
people who are elect, that means he has set his affection on them. And the word beloved is a word that in its construction uh, conveys somebody has loved you. Your beloved. And so when he addresses them, beloved, it's not just a sentimental term, it's a term of identification. I'm addressing people that God has set his affection on. God has claimed for his purposes. And uh, most of the time, in fact, uh, four out of the six times, it's, it's this pastoral appeal kind of beloved. People just like the Adel Foy we saw last night in, uh, in James. He talks about heaven six times. Holy is important. Uh, destruction. Apoleia. That's prominent. As his glory, world, and savior. Savior occurs in every chapter. And uh, remember that the word savior, you know, has a wide range of meanings, but it especially uh, carries this idea of somebody who rescues. You know, uh, you had that terrible story over here on the east side somewhere. And I think they just, my wife, my wife is my, my news person, you know. Uh, she'll say, well, you know, yeah, I think it was yesterday she said, and she didn't have to explain herself, she just said, uh, she shot him in the head and set fire to the house before she drove into the lake. You know who I'm talking about? Yes. This is what, two or three weeks ago? The, the, like the morning uh, radio was, was a buzz with this SUV that had driven into a lake and uh, <coughs> some kids had run into a 24-7 Walmart and said our, you know, our house is burning and and uh, all the kids survived, right? Yes. And there was a, an EMT or somebody, and I mean, you just, it's just hard to believe, because you know, it's cold, the water's cold right now, and it, it was before daylight. But apparently this guy's like driving to work and he sees this SUV drive off the, the road and, and out into the lake. And what does he do? Well, I'm sure he called 911, but he jumps into the lake. And it's dark. And he, you know, this thing is underwater. And he goes down there in the dark, and somehow he discerns that there's still an air pocket in this SUV, and there's something bobbing around. And it turned out to be this baby. And I, you know, how did he get the window? It's not easy to get a window open from the outside, but he got into that, and he got that baby, and that baby's alive. That's a savior. <laughs> You know, and, and, and savior in in, uh, in churchianity can just be kind of this term of honor that's pretty meaningless. But when the Bible talks about God being a savior, that's what he's talking about. That's what it's talking about, is that we were like that baby bobbing around underwater in the SUV, and somebody did the improbable and impossible and inexplicable. I mean, why would you endanger your life to jump into... In, in March, water's probably 33 degrees. You know what 33 degrees, I mean, if you're not really determined, as soon as you hit the water, you're gonna be paralyzed. It's not easy to function in water that cold. I mean, you've just gotta, you've gotta probably have to have training and just a lot of courage and a lot of focus. But when you add up all those factors, I, you know, that baby, statistically, the baby's dead. As soon as that, that SUV hit the water, that baby was history. But there was somebody who overcame all these odds and, and cared enough to put themselves on the line to go after this baby. And uh, I think that's why Savior occurs in every chapter of Second Peter. Because Peter knows what dire straits people are in, and he knows there's only one way for God's people to get through it, and that's to cling to their savior because he's on an ongoing res rescue operation in all of our lives and in all of us in some ways are underwater you know we're facing things that are bigger than we are and we may not be aware of it today and if so you know count your blessings but it's coming <laughs> but we have a savior 
And so uh, let's take five minutes and we'll return. Thank you.